Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant has become yet a renewed concern for the fate of life on our planet, especially in the northern hemisphere, which is of course strongly affected by the wind patterns of whatever radiation might be released from Fukushima. In fact, some are claiming <clears throat> that uh, a very large amount of radiation has already been released. And by claiming, I say that with a bit of satire because of course it's happened. There's multiple meltdowns already happened. And uh, the, that, the, that cover up is being called Plume Gate. So just search that term if you wanna learn more, Plume Gate. And now Senator Ron Wyden, who uh, actually is a, a pretty decent guy. I, I used to live in Oregon in his district when he was a congressman. And I, you know, I don't agree with all his politics, obviously, but uh, pretty decent guy, you know, really within the system, he tries to help people uh, more than most, I would say. And he went out and visited, uh, he went out and visited the Fukushima facility to have a look for himself. And when he came back, he issued an urgent warning. He, he put it right on his own website, the government website, con uh, Senate website. And he said that it is a precarious situation. And he said that the entire facility is only protected from a second tsunami by uh, something that he called the bags of rocks placed there, a, a makeshift wall, he said, made by uh, bags of rocks placed there by hand. That's not gonna survive a tsunami. That's not gonna stop a giant tidal wave coming in, not even a chance. Now at the same time, a former Japan uh, ambassador has gone on the record and made a statement saying that, quote, the fate of the world depends on reactor number four. Those are his words. So there's been a lot of increasing concern about the fuel rod, the spent fuel rods that are in the pools that are now have open access to the environment and what might happen if there is a subsequent earthquake or a tsunami, which could happen theoretically at any time, it's, a, it's largely unpredictable, what will happen? And to help answer that question is Arne Gunderson joining us today by Skype video, an amazing expert. He's been one of the most courageous scientific voices speaking out about the reality of what's happening in Fukushima, even as others try to cover up and downplay. Arne Gunderson has been actually reporting the truth from his website, fairwinds.com, that's F-A-I-R-E, winds. Dot com. Did I get that right? Is that, the, is that the right website? You got it. Yeah, okay. All right. Arnie, thank you for joining us today. It's a pleasure to have you on the Alex Jones Show. How are you doing today? Hi, thanks for having me. I'm great. Well, it's, it's, it's an honor to have you on. You are one of the, the most widely known voices out there in the truth movement uh, uh, and also among the scientific followers of what's happening in Fukushima. Can you begin by telling us what is your understanding of the status, the current status of the situation in Fukushima, and in particular, reactor number four and its spent fuel rod pool. Um, yeah, I think you hit the nail on the head at the beginning of the hour here. The um, um, unit four is, uh, has always been, uh, since the very first week or two of the accident, in my mind, the, the biggest concern. And, and the, the term I used a year ago was that if uh, the unit four fuel pool goes, we'll have Chernobyl on steroids. And, and, and I still believe that today. The, the problem with that pool is that um, there's an entire nuclear core's worth of hot fuel, and by that I mean physically hot because it just ran, and four or five more years of spent fuel. Um, the combination means that if it were to go dry, that it would um, burn and liberate an enormous amount of radiation. Um, Brookhaven National Lab said that uh, a, a fuel pool fire like could be experienced at, uh, at Fukushima Daiichi 4 would, um, would kill 186,000 people from cancer. Now, so, is, that, is that just a fire situation if the, let's say the pool, the, the containment concrete cracks, the water drains out or, or another earthquake happens, it all collapses. Is it, is it a fire that releases that or is there the possibility of it achieving again criticality or a, a meltdown scenario? Um, no, it can't. Yeah, low enriched fuel, like in a power reactor, has to have water around it to have a fission, to, to, you know, for, for a chain reaction to occur. Now, what would happen um, if, you know, what I'm postulating is if there's, a, if there's a 775 earthquake and the pool cracks, or the building topples, but let's say the pool cracks, um, the pool runs dry, the zircaloid clad it would become hot enough to burn in air. And, and it's called a pyrophoric reaction. The, um, um, once it starts, you can't put it out by throwing water on it. 
because it takes the oxygen out of the water and just gets hotter. So this would be like a massive dirty bomb essentially being set off and it would just burn and release into the atmosphere and then the wind takes it from there, is that what you're saying? Yeah, that's a great analogy. So uh, if, let me ask you this, if a terrorist group had this much nuclear material in their hands, uh, how do you think America's response would be different? Because I find it interesting that this is essentially a dirty bomb, a ticking time dirty bomb, and uh, America's doing essentially nothing. But if a terrorist had this much material, how bad would that be, Arnie? You know, we've been saying that here in the States, and you know, I'm on record as saying that this type of reactor, this Mark I reactor, you know, this fuel pool is up in the air uh, about a, 100 feet high, and it, it's a terrorist target. And, and th this isn't since Fukushima. This, I've been saying this for 10 years. The, uh, um, the problem is if a terrorist were to broach the side of the, um, uh, of the fuel pool with you know, some kind of a, a, a guided weapon, not, not a rifle. Like but, an RPG or something like that. Yeah. Uh, Gee that, that um, you would drain the pool here in the States. Um, and, uh, I, and, and it would create the same scenario. So this isn't something that the NRC and the nuclear community hasn't heard. They've just ignored it. What's, this, what's the deal with the other pool of stored fuel rods that's located reportedly about 50 meters away from this reactor number four pool? What's, what's the interaction between those two pools? The, um, uh, the Japanese, unlike the Americans, have kept all their nuclear fuel in the fuel pool. Uh, you know, so you've got a plant like Pilgrim, Pilgrim with 37 years worth, whereas Fukushima only has seven or eight. Um, the Japanese took the fuel down out of these precarious pools when they got to five, six, seven years and put them in a common pool. So they have an enormous common pool, but it's at grade level. Uh, so. From a seismic standpoint, it's much more rigid. The, the, the Fukushima 4 pool is way up in the air, so it's like an upside-down pendulum in the event of an accident. My, you know, in addition to Unit 4, and, and I'm clearly on record as saying both these, uh, Unit 3 is not much better. So there's actually two fuel pools that could um, that, that could cause, you know, uh, certainly a, the, the the evacuation of Tokyo would be plausible if that pool were to um, uh, were to catch fire. What about the evacuation of California? Would it, it would How much of a concern would it be if that pool, the, if the fuel rods in pool four caught on fire and that, that radiation was released and all the isotopes, the iodine-131, the cesium-137, I think is a bigger concern. Uh, how, what, in your estimation, what is the range of possibilities of impacts on states like California, Oregon, uh, Alaska, Washington, especially West Coast, USA? Yeah, you, well, first of all, you're not going to find any iodine because that only has an eight-day half-life. So it's been gone for years. But the, the amount of cesium in those pools is roughly comparable to what's gone up in nuclear weapons testing, above-ground nuclear weapons testing for, the, you know, for, for 30 years. Um, my, my, I'm telling my friends that on the West Coast, you got to watch it like a hawk. Every day, go up and make sure Unit 4 is standing. And if it's not, um, you know, we'll, we'll watch the plume, but, but have, a, have a plan B to, um, uh, you know, to move somewhere. Well, that's great advice, Arnie, and I want to encourage uh, viewers and listeners to visit your website, fairwinds.com. Again, that's spelled F-A-I-R-E, fair, almost fairywinds.com <laughs> might be the, 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 the phon phonetic way to say it. But the... The, the problem with what you just said, or I should say the challenge, is that the mainstream media has already demonstrated it's going to lie about this. So if the average person out there in California, let's say, says, well, I'm going to watch CNN and I'm going to wait for CNN to tell me whether or not there's been a, a, a big release of radiation from Fukushima, isn't it possible that CNN may just never cover it? Or they may downplay it? Or the, the, the U.S. government may come up with some kind of weird cover story? At, Hasn't the truth already been manipulated so much that we can't really trust the media to tell us the future of what's going on there? Well, I, I, I don't trust the mainstream media. Uh, actually, though, I mean, CNN had me on 20 times, so I probably they've done better than most of the others. Oh, I but, wasn't aware of that. That's actually to their credit to, to have you on then. Well, thank you. But, uh, but you're absolutely right. The mainstream media has underplayed the Fukushima disaster uh, you know, since, since it began. Um, and, uh, you know, it's through alternative shows like yours. It's through alternative sites like mine. 
um, that, that people are getting the, the knowledge that experts have. You know, all the things I've been saying for the last year are turning up in FOIA requests from the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. They were thinking it. They just weren't telling the public. <laughs> right. You nailed it. The FOIA requests have revealed a lot of interesting information where wasn't one of the documents from the NRC showing that by their calculations, they had already estimated that eight was it 18,000 uh, infant deaths had occurred in the USA due to the radiation? Or am I getting that right? I don't remember seeing that one, but there were so many that were terrifying. You know, they, they had data from the roof of the embassy in Tokyo in the first week that was terrifying. And yet they never made that, that information public. We had a, um, a businessman in Tokyo who was staying on the same block as the U.S. Embassy um, take a sample from the roof of his hotel, and, and it was harder than a pistol. And this was six months after the accident. So um, you know, we have known that Tokyo was jeopardized at the beginning of this accident since it was happening and really didn't do much to, um, uh, to warn the citizens. Wow, for those watching PrisonPlanet.tv, they just showed the footage of one of the explosions of one of the reactors. I don't, was that reactor number two that uh, was being shown there? I don't know. But uh, it, it looks like a massive explosion. Some, there's been conjecture that perhaps it was a, a nuclear explosion. I'm not, I'm not sure. Uh, what are your thoughts on that, Arnie? Yeah, the, it, um, it was a prompt, moderated criticality. <laughs> okay, you're going to have to break that down for us all. <laughs> well, um, a bomb is a prompt, fast criticality. Uh, a nuclear reactor is usually never prompt. Um, <laughs> yeah, unfortunately. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'll be... This could take an hour, but I'll try to knock it out in 30 seconds. Well, imagine like all, all the power that would power the city of Tokyo for 10 years being released in two seconds is what kind of what you're getting at. Well, that, that's what a bomb is, right? Um, if your readers want to go, your, your listeners want to go up and watch this, you can see that we tested this 40 years ago in an experiment called Borax, B-O-R-A-X, just like the, the, the 20 mules. Um, the uh, borax experiments look almost exactly like the explosion of Fukushima Unit 3. And those were prompt, moderated criticalities. Okay, so it's not, not the same as a detonation of a nuclear warhead, obviously, but it's certainly a much faster release than was planned by the engineers who built the facility. Now, one of the things I really respect about you, Arnie, is that you visited Japan. You took some soil samples, and I believe on your website, fairwinds.com, you even mentioned that in the United States, those soil samples, uh, they are so contaminated with radiation that they would be considered, what, what was the term you used? Oh, they'd be considered radioactive waste, and they'd have to be, you know, stored in a, in a controlled facility, yeah. So that soil, how far out from Fukushima did you sample that soil? Well, you know, that's the point I was trying to make in the video. Uh, Tokyo is, uh, depending on where you are, 150 miles uh, away from, uh, from the accident, and, and yet... I mean, these people were gardening in soil that was, in the States, would be considered radioactive waste. And wow. when I, was, I, I shot the video when I was at a meeting in Washington, D.C., and my point was Tokyo is the capital of Japan, and um, within, 50, within 100 miles of Washington are a dozen nuclear reactors. How would we feel if, if our capital was so contaminated that it should be considered nuclear waste. I think the public reaction would be dramatic. You know, we've got to shut these things down. Whereas because it's happened in the other guy's country, um, mainstream media has totally ignored it. But you hit on something really crucial right there. You said that the soils are so contaminated, and that was with, with cesium-137, correct? Cesium-137 and 134. That's how you know it came from Fukushima. If it was just cesium-137... It could be bomb, it could be Chernobyl, but when you see 134 and 137 together, that's the signature from Fukushima. All right, that's because every, every uh, fuel source in the nuclear industry has a particular uh, elemental signature or fingerprint, you might say, that can identify its source. Uh, and what's, what's crucial about what you just said also is that the, if the soils are contaminated, cesium is very close to the, the mineral action of potassium in plants. So I believe that when plants are grown, when food crops are grown in soil contaminated by cesium, to the extent that those plants would normally uptake potassium, which is a common mineral in many 
many crops, including potatoes, for example, they would uptake that cesium, which would go into the food, so that the people who grew their food on that land would then be eating radioactive food. Yeah, cesium is exactly chemically like potassium. If you remember your high school chemistry, they're right above each other in the periodic chart. But the, um, so they're both muscle seekers. And what we find with, um, with, with cesium poisoning is that, especially in kids that are growing, um, illnesses like something called Chernobyl heart, uh, where the cesium builds uh, up in a muscle that's rapidly growing, like an infant or a fetus's heart, and causes heart damage or heart holes, um, that um, while the, the infant may live for the rest of their life um, after surgery, you know, their, their life is, um, expectancy is shortened and the quality of life is, is minimal. So cesium is a muscle seeker. It, it also produces cancers, obviously, but because it's radioactive. But in addition, it can do damage to muscles, especially in kids that are uh, rapidly growing. So this, this, yeah, this is an indiscriminate, uh, um, obviously it can be used as a weapon by terrorists or, or even false flag attacks, that, which is another concern of many of the listeners here on the Alex Jones Show. We had a, a report from Mike Bundrant, who's one of our, our contributing writers over at Natural News. He was in Tokyo recently, and he discovered that many families are eating this contaminated food because their parents or their other family members are living in a state of denial. They've been told by the Japanese government that this is safe, so they're planting food on this contaminated soil, they're eating this radioactive food, and they, they are doing so knowing it's radioactive, but they're, they're, they can't go against their other family members because of the very powerful you know, uh, parental family structure often in, that you find in Japanese families. And the, these middle-aged uh, Japanese citizens, are, they're going to die of cancer from it. You know, you're absolutely right. It's a cultural problem there, and the government is playing on the cultural problem. Um, there's a, there's a ray of hope here because the women of Japan aren't buying it. Um, the men seem to be saying, well, my government told me it's safe, therefore it's safe. Whereas the women, especially the young child-bearing age women, are, are just saying, uh, you know, hell no, we won't glow, I guess is the old term. <laughs> That's a good one. But they, the, um, the, the women in Japan are um, a significant majority in all of these marches that you see, which is unheard of for Japan. I mean, the, the women... Right. Are Arnie, out. Arnie, sorry to interrupt you. we got to go to a break, but stay with us. I want to ask you on the other side of this break about the 85 times Chernobyl radiation figure that's been floating around. That and much more straight ahead here on The Alex Jones Show. We'll be right back after this break. Sick of the globalist eugenesis control freaks adding poison to your water and laughing as you get sick and die? Start purifying your water with ProPure. My friends, I've done a lot of research, and the best gravity filter out there, bar none, is ProPure. And it's available discounted at Infowars.com. Its filters are silver impregnated to prevent bacterial growth. There's no priming required. It's NSF 42 certified. Optional fluoride filters can reduce fluoride up to 95%. Easy to set up and use. Does doesn't require electricity. Purify water from lakes, streams, ponds, and wells. This filter system leaves in beneficial minerals, which is key. Save money by not buying bottled water and avoid BPA that leaches from the plastic. ProPure is the best gravity-fed filter out there. It's what my family uses. Infowars.com already has the lowest price on ProPure. But if you add the promo code WATER at checkout, you get an additional 10% off at Infowars.com. You can also call to order 888-253-3139. Fukushima threatens the continuation of life as we know it in the Northern Hemisphere. It doesn't mean it's going to kill us all, but it does mean it could threaten the, 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 the healthy continuation of life as we know it. It could threaten crops. It could threaten literally millions of acres of farming land across North America if a worst-case scenario happens. And, and sadly, the worst-case scenario uh, could be unleashed in many ways from another earthquake, another tsunami that hits the Fukushima facility. This is an issue that affects North America. It affects Europe. It, it, it affects Russia. It affects China. It's not just Japan that's affected by this. And that's why we're featuring this information here. We've got Arnie Gunnarsson joining us from Fairwinds. And he is one of the top uh, nuclear experts and very outspoken, but also very considered in his information. That's what I really respect about Arnie that he is methodical in his research and he's very considered in his uh, statements about Fukushima. Before we bring him back in very quickly, 
In the next hour, we're going to be joined by Dr. Len Saputo to talk to us about some solutions for protecting our bodies from radiation in case that worst case scenario happens. And then also we've got Alex Jones calling in at the, um, well, what about half an hour from now? Alex is going to call in and give us some comments on current events as well. Now, back to Arnie Gunnison from fairwinds.com. Arnie, before the break, I asked you about this figure that's been floating around this 85 times. I guess there's been a calculation of the total amount of, of unspent fuel or partially spent fuel in the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear facility. And that was calculated to be 85 times, roughly 85 times the amount of, of uh, energy released in the Chernobyl accident in, I believe, 1986. Is, is that figure accurate or does it need to be fact-checked? Um, yeah, I, I'm not sure where they got that. Uh, it, I believe Fukushima is worse than Chernobyl, and, and I'm, I think I can prove that. I think that that number may also include um, the, the possibility of the meltdown of the fuel in the fuel pools, which hasn't occurred yet. So um, if you look at the three reactors that melted down, um, clearly they released more noble gases, things like xenon and krypton, at least triple what uh, what Chernobyl released, and they actually picked that up in um, in Seattle. Um, this is separate from the hot particles in Seattle, but uh, there was uh, xenon and krypton picked up to the tune of a hundred thousand times normal uh, in Seattle in March and April after the accident. Published peer-reviewed stuff, but th so that's one kind of isotope, and that doesn't react with anything; it pops right out of the fuel. But the um, um, this, the um, uh, cesium and the um, iodine and, and things like that are probably roughly on the order maybe twice as much as Fukushima. You, you know, it's, this is such a horrific accident, but it's hard to believe the Japanese were lucky. But there's, there's two things they were lucky about. One is that 80% of the time the wind blew out to sea. Now, so most of this, 78% of this radiation wound up in the ocean. That's not good for the fish and ultimately not good for us, but it's good for the people in Japan. The, the other piece of it was it happened on a Friday, and they had a, a thousand people at Daiichi and a, another thousand at uh, uh, Daini. Uh, had that not happened, if it happened on a weekend, um, Daini would have melted down as well. There's four reactors there that would have melted down as well. So uh, we could have had 10 nuclear reactors melting down uh, if this thing had happened on a Saturday. Well, this gets back to the, the, the whole thing called Murphy's Law, and I, I'm really starting to question the, uh, the ability of science to anticipate the long-term implications of its present-day actions. I want to ask you about that, and how can science be made safer when we return on the other side of this break? You are listening to The Alex Jones Show, an interview with Arnie Gunderson about Fukushima and radiation. And the next hour begins in just minutes, so stay with us. We'll be right back. Have you been to InfoWarsShop.com lately? Express your inner patriot with these brand new InfoWars t-shirts. Say it loud with the InfoWars bullhorn shirt. Or educate the sheeple with the Bill of Rights shirt. Grope the public's mind with the TSA shirt. And with this shirt, you can let the dark side know of the Rebel Alliance's power. All available at InfoWarsShop.com. And we continue to be joined by Arnie Gunderson, nuclear industry expert and outspoken scientist. I don't know if outspoken is the right word, just to somebody who's willing to tell the truth, you know, which is so rare today that it almost seems uh, extraordinary. But it is just someone willing to tell the truth. He continues with us. Arnie, uh, are, are you still there? Yeah, I'm still here. Okay, great, great. Uh, so you, in the last segment, we talked about how... The amount of radiation released from Fukushima has already vastly exceeded the amount released from Chernobyl and that catastrophic accident in Ukraine. But what about the amount of energy contained in these the, the partially spent fuel rods that, that could conceivably burn? Is there any estimation of how much energy is in that fuel compared to Chernobyl? Oh, that would be 20 times Chernobyl. But I'm sure, you know, so you're, suddenly that 85 doesn't look too unrealistic when you start looking at any single fuel pool. You know, I said earlier, you know, everybody's focused on Unit 4, and, and rightfully so, 
But Unit 3 had a more severe explosion, and this likely structurally uh, weakened even more than Unit 4. And the Unit 3 pool has about half as much nuclear fuel as the Unit 4 pool. So it's not, it's not clear to me um, um, that, that Unit 3 is a whole heck of a lot better. What is the thinking behind this idea of whoever engineered these these nuclear power plants? And I know uh, U.S. corporations. I think General Electric was one was part of the key designer. You can correct me if I'm wrong about that. But what is this idea of let's store nuclear fuel 30 meters above the ground in a pool? Why not always store it at ground level or underground, even on site? That, that's a great question. I asked that question 40 years ago when I started my career, and at the time, uh, they, they don't do that anymore. Uh, the, it's just this Mark I reactor and, and a few Mark IIs that, that do that. All the other boiling water reactors, the Mark Threes, and all the other pressurized water reactors do store it down low. The, the, at the time this thing was designed, you've got to remember, this was designed in the mid-60s. Um, they were afraid that if they opened gates and, and, and the fuel pool was lower than a nuclear reactor, they could drain the nuclear reactor. So if they put the pool on the same elevation as the reactor, that wouldn't happen. So there, there was a logic behind it, but then they, uh, they basically developed a better fuel transfer mechanism that that doesn't happen. I see. Uh, you know, the, the, you can get this fuel out of these pools. The, the, the technology's there. Um, this uh, dry cask storage is available, and there were dry casks at Fukushima. They all survived the tsunami just fine. In the U.S., we could take all of our fuel pools that are totally overcrowded and put them on the ground. Um, but the problem is the, the NRC is letting the utilities that own them get away with it because they don't want to spend the money. Well, of course. It's, isn't it always about saving money, even if they put the population at risk, and that's the sad part about this. But if you get back to the 1960s, when this was being designed, this this is this is this a Mark One facility or a Mark Two? This is a Mark One. Mark One. Certainly, in the 1960s, the scientists at that time must have known that Japan, that whole region, was geologically extremely active. That was that's not a big secret even in the 1960s. How could they? I'm, I'm not asking. I'm not accusing you obviously you didn't put it there but i'm asking you to try to help us understand what kind of weird thinking went on how could they even place a nuclear facility right on the coast where it would be hit by a tsunami uh, um, ten, 10 seconds and we got to go to break okay. and, then, and we'll answer it on the other side okay great okay sorry i, I didn't mean to set you up like that arnie <laughs> my, my timing mistake there but we'll be back with an answer to that question and much more straight ahead on the alex jones show this is mike adams filling in stay with us a lot more straight ahead we'll be right back we've got a fukushima situation that quite literally threatens life as we know it in the northern hemisphere it doesn't mean it would instantly kill us all but it could unleash radiation that could kill us slowly it's the big slow kill situation it could contaminate our food supply for literally centuries if if the worst case happens so we want to prevent that we want to solve this problem and just before the break arnie gunderson from fairwinds.com who is probably arguably the most respected expert who's speaking out on this issue he said that we have the technology to remove the fuel from these precarious fuel pools and put them in a safer storage location so my question to you, Arnie, and thank you for your continued time with us here. I know you're extremely busy, and I really honor your, your, your time here on the show. Why isn't the international community, and the U.S. in particular, on all hands on deck, red alert, let's go over there and solve this problem Im immediately and eliminate this danger now? Uh, my one-word answer is, is money. The, um, you know, and it's not... We didn't have to wait for Fukushima to know that uh, that that a problem of this nature was was looking over our shoulder. Um, there there have been experts out there saying it for years, my, myself included. Um, there there's this stuff called dry cask storage, where after the fuel's about three or four years old, it will can can be cooled in air, and so it gets put in these casks. It's still hotter than a pistol from a radiation standpoint, but the physical heat is down. They put them in these huge casts that weigh 100 or more tons, and they set them on the ground. And uh, uh, until we get a, a long-term storage solution, the best place is out of those pools and on the ground. 
the, um, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission is playing games with this, and they're saying, well, we need to consider all of the costs um, as well as the benefit of getting it out of the pool. But wait, but wait a minute, let me interrupt you there, I, and I apologize, Arnie, but when they needed to bail out Goldman Sachs, they came up with the money. They just created a trillion dollars out of nothing, and they bailed out the banks. So <clears throat> how is it that, that banks, that saving the banks is more important than saving humanity, potentially? <laughs> I mean, I, does, does the NRC, does the U.S. government not understand a scale of dangers? I, I don't get this. Why are, the, why are the banks more important than saving humanity? No, I think you're absolutely right. You know, and the money's there. It, it's not like, you know, well, for the banks, we had to create the money, sort of. But there's a, 30, a $27 billion fund for long-term storage. Now, that's set aside for looking for geological storage and things like that. But uh, we could use that fund. So we have been put, putting in a tenth of a penny per kilowatt of nuclear power we use for years and years and years. And so this fund has developed over $20 billion. We could use that fund to put it all into, put all these uh, fuel pools in the dry cast storage. And this problem would be solved, both from a terrorism standpoint as well as from you know, an act of God like at Fukushima. This is solvable. What kind of time frame, if the money were made available today, let's say if the Federal Reserve actually wanted to solve this problem, and they went into their little computer and they typed in some digits and created another trillion dollars like they did every time they wanted to bail out Wall Street, uh, if that money were available, what are we talking in terms of total cleanup? Like 10 weeks? Longer? Six months? What, what's the, what do you think it is? You just have to fabricate the containers, and it would probably take a year or two to, to fabricate enough containers. So, you know, certainly within three years, it's solvable. And, and it doesn't even take an act of Congress or the Federal Reserve. It just takes the Nuclear Regulatory Commission saying, do it. But even, okay, if you say two or three years to create these containers... Uh, but in that time frame, then, between now and the time that this is solved, uh, an earthquake, uh, you said a 7 or a 7.5 magnitude earthquake with an epicenter uh, near Fukushima could bring this pool down before the problem is solved and, and thereby un unleash this massive amount of radiation. It seems like we are at risk for this time period. And, and the government has, the, the NRC hasn't even announced that it's going to take these steps to solve it. So we could be facing this risk for a decade, couldn't we? Well, we've got, yeah, there's two, two questions there. One, I, I, what I was talking about is in the U.S., we could solve this in three years and just pray there's no earthquake. Um, you know, in Fukushima, I, I, was on, I was on Chris Martinson a year ago, and I, I explained how you could solve this problem, which was to build a building outside the building to lift the nuclear fuel out. And just last week, Tokyo Electric said, you know, we're going to build a building around the building. <laughs> they, they are taking way too long to solve this problem because of exactly the concerns that, you know, another earthquake could come. But it, so it seems like we are being smothered by red tape here. We are. It's, it's like humanity is hanging on the edge of a cliff by our fingernails, figuratively speaking. This radiation of, of release could happen at any moment if... If Mother Nature, if an earthquake takes place, and yet governments everywhere, Japan and the U.S. in particular, are dragging their feet on this and, and doing nothing. They're not taking responsibility. They're not, even, they're not even serving the interests of the people that they claim to represent. This, this is pathetic. This is sad because it's a case of almost another you know, you know, demo side, death by government, if the worst case happens. Well, I think it's you know, death by the nuclear industry deeply infused into government here. This is a, uh, you know, the, the regulator, the Japanese have a great word for it. That when when um, people uh, working for the regulator go to work at a high level and well-paying jobs at the utility, uh, they call it ascent into heaven. Um, so there's this... <laughs> Oh, yeah. There's this coziness, and it's with the, the IAEA, uh, who I've seen papers say that they're a watchdog. In fact, Article 2 of their charter says their goal is to promote nuclear power. So the industry and the government are essentially one no matter where you go. The, the Prime Minister of Japan now was the finance minister during the accident, and one of his emails surfaced about, uh, oh, about a month ago, and it said it was from three weeks after the accident, and he said, whatever you do, do not affect TEPCO. 
So, wow. you know, they've been more interested in protecting TEPCO and, and their own bureaucratic butts than they have been about protecting the people of Japan. Well, what's new? And what, what government body or department doesn't want to cover its own butt? Or, in, in, hey, in the case of uh, the ATF or the DEA in America, they actually uh, uh, create problems so they get bigger budgets and, and become more powerful. The CDC did that. The FBI does that, running these false uh, terror events. But that's, that's a different topic. Let me ask you this. Um, I noticed that the, uh, the general public has a very poor understanding of what I would call relative risk. Um, I was trained as, uh, uh, in a scientific way as an engineer, very strong background in mathematics. And I often think about uh, the relative risk of events. A lot of people are concerned about, let's say, Yellowstone exploding. Well, that happens once every 600,000 years. Or they're, they're concerned about a comet or an asteroid hitting the planet. That's possible. But in terms of relative risk, the Fukushima event is, is here now. It is, it is orders of magnitude more likely than many of these other concerns that tend to dominate people's psychological focus. Can you speak to this issue of relative risk and having a, an appropriate perception of what risks really exist? Uh, yeah, I, I have a saying. Uh, sooner or later in any foolproof system, the fools are going to exceed the proofs. And I, I think that um, we fooled ourselves at Fukushima, we as, a, as the world. And, and all, essentially, this, the, this concept is for any reactor, but let's look at Fukushima. You know, we knew we could build a power plant that could withstand a, a, a Richter 7 and a, a, a 3 meter, a 9 foot tsunami, so that's what we built. And um, we fooled ourselves into thinking that that's what Mother Nature was going to give us, a, a seven Richter, three foot, uh, a three meter tsunami. Um, the economics to build a plant to withstand a Richter eight or a, a, a 60 foot tsunami would have made it so you wouldn't have built that nuclear plant. You couldn't have afforded to build that nuclear plant. So I think that in the back of the people's minds who are advocates of the technology, they convince themselves that Mother Nature is going to be benign. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. No, I'm just laughing. Keep going because they're they're so they're so wrong. Mother Nature always gives you it, it hands you something that's completely unanticipated. In fact, you cannot even imagine the human mind. Even even a brilliant nuclear engineer, nuclear physicist, cannot accurately anticipate the the unexpected nature of Mother Nature. You know, my, my journey has been from, you know, pro-nuclear, senior vice president, and then I got to the point when I blew the whistle and the Nuclear Regulatory Commission took bribes and deliberately botched the inspection. I still believed in the technology, but I didn't believe in government. And now, the, you know, the Fukushima accident has pushed me over, and, and I'm at a point where, just like what you said, I don't believe that mankind can build something strong enough that Mother Nature can't knock it down. And... Considering the consequences, you know, it's not just the risk. The, the, if it was, you know, one person getting knocked over a tsunami, that's one thing. But the risk of this um, and, and the consequences. Yeah, the yeah, it has to be risk versus consequences because that, that's the other side of the equation. Yeah, you know, Gorbachev said that uh, in his memoir, so this is a smart guy, he's been around a while. He said that it wasn't perestroika that ruined the, um, the Soviet Union, it was Chernobyl. Hmm. I think we're seeing the same thing here with Fukushima. This is going to be a half a trillion or more dollars, and that works out to be about $4,000 for every man, woman, and child in Japan. And uh, it's going to bring that country to its knees. Do, is, do we want a technology that can be perfect for 40 years and then have one bad day? In and wipe you out. Very good question, Arnie Gunderson. We're almost out of time. I want to encourage people to visit your website, fairwinds.com. And, and Arnie, any, any final thoughts you want to add in the, in the next 30 seconds as yeah, we round this up? Just real quick. You know, we've been, uh, we've been told that nuclear is safe and we can store the nuclear waste for a quarter of a million years. Uh, but those same people are saying we can't use solar because we can't store the solar electricity overnight. And that doesn't make sense to me. If we can develop a technology to store nuclear waste for a quarter of a million years, we can certainly develop batteries or something to store the sun overnight. Well said. Arnie Gunderson from Fairwinds.com. Thank you, Arnie, for joining me today. A real honor to have you on. I enjoyed the conversation with you immensely. On the other side of this break, Alex Jones joins us. And thank you again, Arnie.
yourselves, what are you doing in this time of great challenge? What are you doing to unlock minds? 